Well, today we'll continue on with our discipleship series. And in case you're not aware, as we are about to become fully immersed in another presidential election cycle, imagine with me one of the candidates standing there at their podium addressing their supporters and declaring that if you are going to vote for me, you are voting to pay higher taxes. You are voting for lower wages. You are voting to forfeit your home ownership and possibly your family. Basically, you are committing to losing everything that you love the most. Now, who's with me? Yeah, we could hear those crickets, right? I don't even know that there would be anger, probably. It would rather be that we're just all stunned. We're pretty puzzled by that approach. I mean, no presidential, I mean, you could reduce that even here to local politics, right? No presidential hopeful would try to promote themselves like this because for most, that would be the final day of their campaign wholeheartedly. The truth is we would much rather prefer to hear promises, even if most of them are just empty promises. We'd rather hear the promises of our lives getting better that we would thrive under their leadership, right? Our finances, our health, our communities, they would find a quick fix and solution with them in office. That's something that we could be inspired to get behind. Over the next two weeks, so today and next week, we'll be breaking down the cost of discipleship section of Luke chapter 14. And today we're going to be specifically focusing on verses 25 and 26, as we begin our look at how a life of following Jesus requires us to regularly check ourselves. And so a little bit of setup here is before we get into that main text, because Luke 14 is full of action. The chapter actually begins with Jesus kind of sparring with the Pharisees over a Sabbath controversy. And in Jesus sensing a troubling trend. You see, this developing trend is that folks are quite self-absorbed and their rules focused when it comes to living. And it moves Jesus to teach on the subject of humility. And then to drive things home a bit more, Jesus employs this story, it's a parable, about three different folks whose other commitments keep them from enjoying a great banquet. And it's within this framing that Jesus then offers some thoughts on the cost of discipleship. Specifically, the price for all that desire to be counted as true followers. And so this morning we're going to jump in here and read Luke 14, verse 25 and 26. You'll see it here on the screens with us. (coughs) Excuse me. It says this, Now great crowds were traveling with him. And the hymn is Jesus. You'll see it on the screen here if Henry catches up. Now great crowds were traveling with Jesus. So he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Those are the words of the Lord for us today. Thanks be to God. Now this appears to be a really poor way to do what we would call win friends and influence others. Right? It's an alarming statement that reminds all of us who are considering becoming followers of Jesus to think long and hard before making the commitment. Now this particular teaching takes place within actually the last year of Jesus's ministry okay it's not too far off from his crucifixion and resurrection and ultimately the ascension and by this time in his travels around Galilee and now turning his focus uh, towards Jerusalem the crowds were getting larger and larger verse 25 right at the beginning of that text we just read tells us that great crowds were traveling with him And when you think about that statement, the the metric that many use to define success is usually high numbers. And so in that 
realm, Jesus appears to be very successful. A lot of us today might even be tempted to tell Jesus, hey man, be happy. Look around. You got all these people with you. This is good. We would remind him that there are enormous crowds following him around. But Jesus has seen the crowds growing behind him, and he knows that some of these followers are really only tagging along to see another miracle. They're really just there to kind of see the show. Some are also there only because they've been caught up kind of in the mob mindset, the mob mentality that developed around Jesus and his disciples. Essentially this, they thought that just by proximity to this messianic figure, that they would maybe get some power. They would get some status or maybe even some wealth. So Jesus, in this moment, turns to this growing crowd and he tells them, unless you're serious about losing everything, you might as well go home. Now, Jesus isn't necessarily trying to get rid of followers. Rather, He wants them, and I believe he wants us too, to know what is involved in being true disciples of his. We need to know what we're getting into when we say we want to be one of Jesus' people. Jesus here is checking our allegiance. He's checking our values, and he wants to convey the high stakes. And so he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. And this seems pretty hardcore. Jesus here is not pulling any punches. The great multitude that enthusiastically followed him at this time thought that he would establish his earthly kingdom with power and might, and that they would receive all of its blessings from being on the right side of this moment. Then they are smacked with such an offensive statement that surely contradicts that whole entire, you know, honoring father and mother bit and that whole golden rule thing, right? I mean, that's like, what? And on the surface, it would seem so. However, this kind of hate is not an emotion like we tend to think of. Instead, it's more of an attitude or a perspective. We've got to go a little bit to the original language, and we won't delve deep in that, but the Greek that is actually being used here in Luke's gospel actually translates better, translates hate as disregard, be indifferent to. It's to love one thing less than something else. So Jesus here is actually using a a hyperbolic or an exaggerated Hebrew expression, which means love less. And in this particular instance, Jesus compares the devotion that one would typically hold sacred only for family members with the commitment required to become one of his disciples. Now hang in there with me because I want to show you that it's a little easier to see what he's getting at just in how Matthew's gospel records the same way. And so Matthew 10, 37, this is how Matthew recorded it for us. He says, the one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, Jesus is not telling people to actively engage in hating their family. So, bad news for a few of you that might have thought, I am going to let my family have it. Were you thinking that at all? Do you read this and you're like, oh, yeah, I can do it, Pedro. I see, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, not what's going on. (laughs) Rather, he's making the point that to follow him means your love. And your devotion to him will make the love of family look like hatred. But to to say Jesus' words are hyperbole or overstatement does not lessen the demand at all. You see, Jesus is making it clear that allegiance to his way, to his kingdom, 
must come even before family. I mean, so much for sentimentality, right? Mm. Doesn't this seem, you know, a bit offensive for Jesus to demand this of us? If it smacks you a little bit, I think that's good. I think it should. And I would say, yes, this is an offensive demand if love, in Jesus' way, were finite. I would say, yes, this is an offensive demand if love in Jesus' way were finite. If my devotion to Jesus actually hurt my ability to love my family, then I would say, yeah, this is way too extreme. But, you probably knew that was coming. The truth is, the more I love Jesus, the more I align myself to him, the more I think like him and the more I begin to see people as he does the more my ability and my capacity to love grows the deeper my love for Jesus the deeper my love can be for others are you with me I think we know that to be true and that's because real love in Jesus's way does not have a limit Okay, it's not like my pot of coffee, right? I got 12 cups of coffee in this pot. And I can give those out, and I'm probably going to keep one for myself. Okay, but at the end of that, that pot's gone. It's over. There's no more to give. It's not like that. You see, in the measuring of God's love, the limit does not exist. I want to say that one more time for us, because I'm telling you, I sat with that truth all week. In measuring God's love, the limit does not exist. See, hoarding it, boxing it in, building up walls will not contain it. Loving Jesus wholeheartedly is being set free to then love limitlessly. And So Jesus warned the would-be disciples that they must be clear about their true allegiance. And those who cannot make that kind of commitment cannot be his disciples. But just wait. There's more, right? That's like the what's behind door B here or the second door. Jesus continued, and you might have caught this. We left this out on our first little dive here. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, and he tagged on after the brothers, sisters, all the family, he says, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. See, in our deeply cost-benefit-minded culture, many of us who identify as Christians do so, I think it's mostly subconsciously, for the supposed earthly benefits. In our lifetimes, the call to following Jesus has, I think, too often been presented as a way to improve our lives. It's kind of been a, packaged as a fix for all of our family and all of our health and our financial and our relationship problems. If you don't think so, sorry. Uh, hopefully there's a few nods. I think that's been part of it. You know, it comes out in things that we would refer to as like the health and wealth gospel. We certainly have a self-help gospel that kind of goes around. And all of those ultimately are focused on who? Focused on me. It's I. Christian writer Jonathan Acuff describes it this way. He wrote about it like this, and he says this, and you'll see it on the screen. He says, I want God to slightly improve me or enhance my existing life. Sometimes I act like the Bible is a self-help book. I treat it like a self-help book for a better marriage, a better attitude, which, you know, maybe at work, and an easier life. You see, what happens is we receive God into our lives mostly kind of, you know, just for that extra dose of grace and goodness to help us get over the next hump of achievement that we just can't quite get on our own. I mean, we tend to see ourselves as relatively good people, which is fine. But, you know, we've got some struggles along the way. And really, if we can just get that divine upgrade, you know, God help version 3.0, that then we'd be all set. Truly, we are like the crowds following Jesus that were hoping to see another miracle. 
we are like those masses that just kind of want to be in general proximity to Jesus so that we can hopefully get some status, some wealth, some health, some good things coming our way. Few of us really want to see ourselves in desperate need of a new way of life. And even fewer of us are willing to accept what is required to embrace that journey. Instead, I think what's happened, and, and this is true in my life, so if this feels, I just want to step out for a quick second. I hope this never feels antagonistic, because I write these words because I agonize over them all week long, because this is so my experience, okay? So I just want you to hear that. And it's hard. It's hard. This is hard, hard words today. But instead, what, it, what we have mostly been discipled in, collectively in the church, is what Dallas Willard, who's a great scholar, he calls it the gospel of sin management. And in this version of following Jesus, our aim is basically to decrease or just tone down all of our sinning until we die and we get to move into our heavenly mansions. And the truth is we love that way of operating. Okay, It's easy. That way of operating is always black and white. It takes the need and the effort for continual transformation off the table. And it replaces it with basically our relative comfort, our physical, our mental, and our spiritual comfort. And truly, perhaps, probably the biggest reason that we are more comfortable just following rules and instructions instead of having to make real-time decisions based on our Christian ethics and principles is that here's the deal. We can all mindlessly follow rules, right? We can flip on the old autopilot and sit back and take it easy. That's because it's always easier when someone else has already decided everything for us. What Jesus is getting at in this particular section here, dealing with ourself. See, the heart of the problem is we are really good at loving ourselves, and it is hard to put that in check. And so the danger of this type of sin management system that so many of us have come about into the faith under is that it trades the considerable costs of new and abundant life in Christ for the comfort of a self-sufficient life of faith. But this isn't what Jesus had in mind for his followers. I want you to hear his words out of Matthew 10, now continuing on from 37, which we read a little bit ago, 38 and 39, this is out of the message paraphrase. It says this, If you don't go all the way with me, through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself, and you look to me, you'll find both yourself and Jesus is saying, love me more than whatever holds first place in your life. More than whatever matters to you the most. More than you love yourself. Truly, it's a dare for us to be wholly committed to surrendering ourselves. Nothing is, nor can anything be, more critical than our commitment to Jesus. See, the cost of discipleship is always choosing to be a builder of God's kingdom at the expense of mine. Richard Rohr says it like this. He says that as a true disciple of Christ, to pray and actually mean thy kingdom come must also be able to, to say, my kingdoms go. So, if we are to be committed disciples of Jesus, last thoughts here today, what is required of us to continue on that journey with him? And so your actionable step for today is, is this. It's make your choice. You see, Jesus is telling us what it takes to be his follower. And it is direct, right? There is no 
soft, sentimental vibe here today. I kind of like soft, sentimental Jesus, quite honestly, if I'm being real with you. That always sits a lot better. You know, you read your daily devotional and you're like, yay, got soft, kind Jesus today. That's not today. See, true disciples must be prepared to part with family and to give up their self-interest for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom way. The promise being, though, there is a great promise here, that if we are willing to listen, if we are willing to learn and to align ourselves to Jesus, he will continue to transform us into his disciples. (coughs) And just as he offered his first listeners an ultimatum of sorts, he extends to us that same choice. He says, come to me. He says, begin now. Start today. And this singular step, this singular choice can be a tiny one. It doesn't have to be some gigantic leap like sometimes we always think of. And yet, we trust that each small step, each small choice, they are essential to move us toward the goal of professing and witnessing to Jesus with our lips and our lives. With our words, yes, and our deeds. Our journey of discipleship truly is made up of countless small steps in the right direction and with the right motives. And there's something that truly amazing happens when we say yes to following Jesus and surrendering our will to his. I know many in this room, you know this, right? Peace by peace, we are changed. And every time we say, yes, I leave behind everything to follow you, we are transformed and we are being reformed to be more and more like Christ. The thought of aligning ourselves with him and his life, I think it really does truly appeal to so many of us, right? Jesus had a draw. If you are a chosen fan, you've got to see that played out on TV in a series that's really good. There's a draw that still happens in the lives of people. We truly want, we like this thought of aligning ourselves. But I think we would rather it come with a little less cost. Hear this, staying home and not accepting this invitation comes at an even higher cost, a higher price. The questions that we have to consider are this. Is it worth it? Is it worth giving up and enduring peace just to live on your own terms? Is it worth sacrificing a life of limitless love to settle for having things the way you like it? Is it worth saying no to God's abundance so that you can hang on to your own limited resources? Jesus wants to give us abundant life and to deepen our relationship with him as we grow in faith. Ultimately, Jesus just wants all of us, to hear his call and to be his true disciples. And he is continually inviting us into that deeper level of commitment. The last question we have to sit with is this. Are we willing to surrender ourselves for the sake of full allegiance to Jesus? This morning, as we have some really fun noises happen out there, which is great, I like hearing that. We're going to end things a little differently than than usual. Um, Usually we don't do any kind of altar call response time. And I want to express real quickly here as we wrap this up today, the reason why is that a lot of times these topics are heavy enough, right? And I don't want to play on emotions because emotions are important. It's part of who we are, but, but God doesn't need emotions to reach hearts. Does that make sense? to pierce your heart and draw you. And so we don't usually do this, but but this morning feels like a proper time to just sit with this for just a little bit. And so there's going to be a song that will play over the system here in just a moment. 
And I'm just going to open this space for if, if you would actually want to pray at this altar. We do have an altar, and you're welcome to pray here. You're welcome to pray right in your seat. But I want us all to just sit with this thought that our, what, what is going on in our lives? Are we truly all in on aligning ourselves to Jesus and surrendering our will to that? Or if there's anything in our way, I would encourage you to pray through that here with Christ right now. And then at the end of the song, it won't be crazy long, I'll come up and we'll pray and we'll dismiss. But let's just spend a little time reflecting here this morning, responding with open hearts as the Lord would minister to us. Let's pray.